Welcome to the Audiation in the Wild podcast with your hosts, Bo Talifer and Eric Rasmussen. Season 3, Episode 6, The Value of Sleep. Okay, let's talk about uh, let's talk about sleep and I mean I guess what we're kind of talking about here is the spacing effect and how the spacing effect impacts learning, but specifically yeah. sleep. Yeah, we did one on practicing just recently, mm -hmm. and like how that how sleep. This is crazy. So go ahead with your stories. This this is really good. Okay, so I was introduced to. Um, a book called Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker from uh, Molly Gebrian, actually, who had uh, we had on the podcast. And she's she has some really when's, great When's resources. her book come out? It should be soon. Yeah, I actually don't know. So we should figure that out. Yeah. But um, We'll have her back in August. So Matthew Walker is a professor of neuroscience and psychology at the University of California, Berkeley. Um He's a sleep researcher, essentially. And his book's really worth reading if you're a musician, I, I think. Um, so there is a, there's a study online you can find from Matt Walker in the early 2000s. And I mean, the, the essence of the study is they had people learning a motor skill, a finger, finger tapping task, a sequential finger tapping task where they were trying to repeat certain sequence of digits by using their fingers. And I mean, basically the, the essence of the study was, is there a difference in someone who learns it at like 10 in the morning and is tested at multiple points throughout the day versus someone who learns it at like 10 at night and is tested after a night of sleep? Um, so that was one of the things they were investigating in the study. And they also wanted to know was, does having an extra practice session actually help anything before you get a full night of sleep. So I'm not going to describe the study in, in ridiculous detail. We'll put a link to it so you can read it. But essentially the findings are that the more you practice, you, you will have gains in speed and reduction in error, but the, the most dramatic changes are going to happen following a good night of sleep, essentially. So having extra practice sessions in the day on this task, I'm not saying for musical tasks specifically, but we'll get into that, doesn't actually pr improve performance that much compared to just having a good night of sleep. And so when you start thinking about things like, okay, I have 10 pages of music to learn for this recital or this performance I'm, I'm going to give, is it better for me to cover everything in one day or, you know, I do two pages on Monday, two pages on Tuesday, two pages on Wednesday. If you have this study in mind and these studies that show that the, the benefits of sleep consolidation have really big impacts on your learning quality, um, this can change the, the practice schedule that you give yourself. So to bring this into a musical context, I mean, I have very much always been of the mindset of doing lots of practice on a piece you know, and then giving it a couple days break. And after I was re-familiarizing myself with this study, I thought, okay, what if I break my piece down into little like one bar chunks? I practice every bar a couple times and I just move on. And I just cover a massive amount of repertoire rather than trying to beat a dead horse every day. And I learned a few new Bach pieces over this past uh, two weeks. And this method of just playing, everything's a, playing everything a couple times to a really good level of quality um, and just moving on, it's amazing how much more you get done rather than playing something like 20 or 30 times. Um, cause these performance gains that you get in the practice session, we play something 20 or 30 times in a row or even multiple times in the day, even if you're spacing it across the day, um, you're better off separating those repetitions over days rather than jamming them into one single day, which is so counterintuitive because we kind of get high off of repeating something over and over again, you know? Totally, and so totally. there's just a lot going on here. And like the, another, another really interesting part of this study that um, Walker talks about is that most of the gains that come from the practice session, cause they had, they had people do their learning session consisted of like 12 trials. So they, they got to practice this task like 12 times. Um, pretty much all the gains came from doing it the first three times. After that, they got a little bit faster with the extra trials, 
but their error rate wasn't really changing. And and basically all of the gain came from like the first few repetitions. So I mean, kind of what I've done in my own practice session is like when learning a new piece, break the piece down into a small enough chunk that you can audiate well and perform on the instrument. So this might be this might be four notes. This might be five notes. If you're working on a piece in like duple that's hacked into 16th notes or subdivisions, I'm talking about starting with like four notes or eight notes, like something you can actually manageably tackle. I'm not talking about just playing through the piece three times in a row. That that probably won't help much unless the piece is really easy for you to play already. But just break it down to something that's small enough, play it a few times, and just move on. And, you know, I was working on, I think, 12, 10 or 12 pages of repertoire like this and just making sure I cover it every day. There's a couple little you know, technically challenging parts in the piece that I gave a few extra repetitions to, but nothing in the realm of like 30 or 40 repetitions, like nothing like that. And so I did this six days in a row and then I took a day off. And when I came back from the day off, it felt like everything got supercharged by the way. But I mean, this is just such an interesting example of how the way that you think about practice has such an impact on how you actually practice, you know? Because most of the musicians I know, and I was like this uh, for the longest time, I just play something a hundred times in a row, right? And 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 that's fine. I mean, maybe maybe you do want to learn a, a certain lick so well that like, who cares about playing something three times and moving on? You're just going to play a hundred times a day for a month anyway. I mean, that might be a better strategy. But when you start talking about having 10, 20, 30 pages of repertoire that's reasonably challenging. You can't just play everything a hundred times a day. You don't have time for that. It's not humanly possible to cover that much repertoire. I mean, people in people in the orchestra that are learning, you know, they're they're gonna have seventy pages of repertoire to move through. You can't triage everything. Even you can't even. You have to have some reasonable way of knowing when to stop. And I have never heard of anyone talking about like three repetitions and just move on. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it's insane, but three, so you're doing a lot less, but you're getting a lot more gain and the gain is happening while you're sleeping. And I remember Molly saying this, it's like mm-hmm. that you don't learn when you're practicing. That's mm-hmm. not when the learning happens. Your brain doesn't do anything. It's yeah, when no. you sleep that the brain does the, you know, the connecting. Yeah, the actual consolidation. And, and so this is something that so Walker talks about. you just need enough input to make your brain exactly. latch onto it when you sleep. Exactly, You yeah. just got to stick it in there. So it's still high concentration level, right? Like, very very much so. Yeah, very much so. And I'm and I'm advocating breaking the, at least initially, break, breaking the piece down to small enough chunks where you can actually master the task. I don't think sloppily going through the piece three times is going to help much, but, you know, getting it, and and there may be some there may be some merit in if if you can take a nap like a thirty or ninety minute nap, um, that's gonna get some of the some of the can sleep some of the sleep consolidation benefits going. So you might actually, if I was working on a piece in the morning and I was able to get in an hour long nap or a ninety minute nap even, which is I mean I'm on vacation now so I'm gonna be doing this, then yeah. there might actually be benefit in practicing again later in the day. But the benefits of hitting something multiple times a day. In terms of motor learning, there might not actually be that much benefit compared when you start thinking of the opportunity costs of working on other repertoire. You might as well just work on more repertoire. Um, another thing the study showed is that the benefits don't just stop from one day. I mean, if you practice something today, you can get sleep consolidation benefits for multiple days in a row, even if you're not practicing it anymore. So this introduces the idea of taking even longer breaks. I mean, the... From my point of view, though, if you can't play a piece at tempo, um, I do think there is some benefit to giving it multiple days off. But when I'm first learning a piece, I'd rather get it up to tempo with daily practice in the sense of hitting it most days of the week. And then I'm going to start taking longer spacing breaks once once the thing's already baked. You know, I, I, I haven't seen really much benefit in taking a week off from something that's not already brought up to the quality that I have it up to. But when something is brought up to the quality in terms of the speed or the, um, you know, I can now play like eight bars at a time manageably, then these longer breaks of like three days, one week, 
they just make it so you don't actually have to be playing this piece every day because that's another problem you have once you start juggling repertoires. Like, how do you maintain pieces? You you don't need to play everything every day. You need some strategy uh, to taper things down. Um, but from what I've seen is that people are playing things all the time at ridiculous repetitions levels and not taking any days off. And that's not necessary, you know, by any means. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, there's a lot there, you know, there's, this has been bottled up inside me for two weeks. So, like, so you're just, <laughs> let me break this down a little bit. All right. So you got a new, really tough Bach piece you were telling me off air. Okay. Yeah. And, and so how many hours a day do you practice? Well, when Generally. I mean, I, I have a nine when, to five job. I'm getting about two hours in a day on my night on the days that right, I'm working. So you got so the, you practice five out of the seven days a week. Well, now or? on the weekends I'm doing more. So weekdays two hours, weekends probably like three or four. Okay, that's a lot. Okay, that's, but not on I mean, all this like, piece, not just this piece, right? No, 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 no. I'm just saying, total, just just the massive time where you're sitting with your guitar and you're learning something, or sure. you're or you're playing. Do you play through stuff? Is there stuff that you just like play through? Like stuff that you already know that like a warm up or. Yeah. So there are um, on the weekends when I'm practicing longer, I that's when I do um, work on repertoire that I don't want to lose. So stuff I've already mastered, it just needs to be played every few weeks or every every two months for even some of the pieces. And so that's when I'm doing that kind of stuff. Yeah. And you get loosened up or whatever. All right. Now yeah, you're going to, yeah. you brand new piece. Maybe you've heard it. So it's not like out of the sky blue, but sure. Uh, it's out of the blue. Here's your tough thing you've never worked on. Yep. And so what do you do? You, it's the, were you talking about reverse chaining earlier? Too? Yeah. So this so. is another strategy I was talking about that works really well with this. So the, the technique that I have now when I'm learning a piece is I, Obviously, I'll listen to it a couple times. I mean, that goes without saying. All the audition okay. stuff is at play so There here. you go. Listen okay. to the thing. So you don't have to run through a piece to get the form. Listen to it to get the form. Yeah, and- I'm actually like really not that interested in doing a run through of the piece. The only reason that I do is to make some kind of decision about fingering because I don't want to start encoding fingering that I'm going to be changing. So I'll look over the piece. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 I will do it. I will sight read it once or twice, but that's kind of it for that. Um, So I've heard the piece. I'm familiar at some level with it. I can't like sing all the bass lines and inner lines from memory and that kind of stuff yet, which I will be able to. So I'll I'll break the piece. Let's just say it's a Bach piece, 16th notes, whole way through in 4 4. Okay. So it's just, it's very easy to navigate. It's like 64 bars, it's all 16th notes. How, how much of the piece at a time am I going to work on? Probably for the first day or two, only macro beats at a time. So I'm going to play four notes at a time, 16th notes, and I'm going to add the following note. So I'm going to play four notes at a time. So I'm just, I'm so literally just, da, 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 no, not even that. I'm just going to go da, 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 da. Just two macro beats. Okay. I'm going to do one macro beat plus the following no, okay. whether or not that's right. a rest or, so I'm going to go through the whole piece like that. And I'm going to, that's the first day I'm going to play each thing max three times. If I can, I'll probably play it twice. If, even if I get it on the first attempt and I just go through the whole piece like that. So you're, you're it's the, you're making it so that no audiational difficulty is happening. No audiation no, di- no, difficulty and no technical difficulty. And I'm, no I'm, tough, I'm, right. I was going to just, yep. Yeah. And so if the, uh, like on the piano, I would actually do this hand separate and then put the hands together on the guitar. I don't do that. I'll just learn both the lines at the same time. If there's a bass line and a, and a melody, but I make sure I can sing the bass line. So I will actually pause for a sec. And, uh, cause normally people can sing the melody that they just played back. If you can't do that, you should be practicing that at the same time, but I will actually make a point out of singing the bass line because if you don't intentionally do that, it's so easy right. for that to just go you know all right and do you alter any of the expressive elements like do it once stronger or, or another yeah. time weaker, yeah so just, it, just for even if it's inappropriate that you would do it with very a different, much so you know muscle 
Yeah, so I, I'll be doing it at a tempo that's manageable. But while I'm doing this, I'm also playing with the phrasing right off the bat. I'm not like trying to wait to get the piece under my fingers before I start changing the phrasing. I'll be I'll be doing diminuendos and crescendos, even with these little tiny. So you're adding your artistic uh, exploration, say from the absolute beginning, because if there's there's no point in like waiting for that. Making music (laughs) doesn't after like after you get the notes. Now we'll add the expression. No, the expression is and I'm memorizing it while I go. I'm memorizing yeah. the, like, and this is how you can memorize pieces manageably is memorize them at five notes at a time rather than eight bars at a time. Yeah. Right? So I do yeah. this, I do this day one and I write down what I did. Okay. I did, I did quarter bar increments in this piece. The next day I now come back and I now, um, blow that up to half bar increments. So now I'm doing basically eight notes plus a note at a time. And, but now this is where, this is where the technique subtly changes. And this is what Eric was talking about. Now, let's say I'm in bar one and I'm doing the first half of the bar. I don't start from beat one. I actually start from beat two. So I go da, 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 beat two. I do that once or twice, make sure I have it. Now I add beat one, da, 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 da. So I'm reverse, I'm, I'm, I'm adding the parts in reverse. And I go so through you're going the, into familiar territory. Exactly. Something you already know comes after the thing that you're working on so that so you're always heading into what you already can audiate and play and then the next day so i go through the whole piece like that max couple repetitions so i don't if i'm working two beats at a time i may end up playing that second beat a bunch of times more than three times but i'm I'm trying not to play that whole unit more than three times once i do it you said the whole piece you didn't mean that no i go through the whole piece like that like that yeah so yeah, in, over in, many over many days no in one day i go through the, i do the whole piece so in one day i cover the whole piece in half bar increments okay right so for day 1 i did the whole piece in quarter bar increments covered the whole 3 pages or 5 pages or whatever it was then the next day i now do the whole piece in half bar increments then the next day i do the whole piece in one bar increments while adding everything in reverse if that makes sense. So on day yeah. three now, I'm at bar, I'm, I'm, I'm doing one bar at a time. And remember, there's, there's 16 notes in a bar. I start with the last four notes. Then I add four before that. Then I add four before that. Then I add four before that. Yeah. And at this point, I'm not really trying to crank the tempo up because I know that the sleep consolidation is what's actually driving the speed up. Don't, don't chase tempo increases in the practice session. It's a giant waste of time. You're do your best to play quickly and accurately, but the real gains in speed are coming from the sleep consolidation. So don't, don't like bludgeon yourself to try to like speed up faster than you can when it's really the sleep that's going to do the work for you. (laughs) Anyway, it seems insane, but it works so well. And then by the time you get this thing into like two or four bar increments, you know, what will happen is like, there will be a level where it's hard for me to play the full two bars or the full four bars, then I knock myself back down to the level before. So if on if on day four I'm at two bar increments and it's just not it's not flowing that well, the next day I go back to one bar and then the day after I go back to two bars and you you'll just kind of blow through whatever the plateau was. Once you get to the point where you're doing two, four, eight bar increments, then you start working you can work with a drum machine i prefer that over a metronome just because it's more fun but you 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 start actually you know one repetition at half speed one repetition at full speed one and you you start playing with the the speed but anyways what i'm getting at is like this method it doesn't seem like it should be enough repetition to learn a piece but it really is you just you're talking about learning over longer you know over over a couple weeks rather than trying to learn it in one day and you get your day's worth of practice on that piece, yeah, within an hour, within forty minutes. Within... Yeah, it depends how it depends how long the piece is, right? Because like, even if the piece is sixty four bars long, are you talking about micro beats at sixty four beat uh, sixty four no, bars? Just, just or, or minutes or, and seconds. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, it probably like... takes probably takes forty five minutes to do like a three page Bach piece. That like the one I'm doing now is like, it's the Giguet in the BWV 996. So it's in like, it's in like 12, eight and it's in subdivisions the whole way. 
So, I mean, there's like, there's like 24 notes per bar and I don't know how many bars there are. Yeah, so there's yeah. three pages of just, you know, just subdivisions. And so that takes me about, it's funny when you, it, that takes me about half an hour to work through like this. It In the might beginning, be three it took, to four minutes worth of music. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But, but the reason I'm so psyched about this is that like, I can play it 40 times a day and nothing better happens than just doing it like three times. I mean, each little section, like, and that's, what's crazy about this. What what happens is if you do it 40 times in the practice session or even throughout that day, you really feel like you're on the ball, like you're getting all this crazy shit done. But over the course of two weeks, nothing happens. That's better than just doing it a couple of times. And, and so really what this introduces is like, do you want to play something 40 times in a row when you're not actually going to get that much more out of it than just doing a few times when you can just work on more repertoire or just do something else with your time. Yeah, and I, that's why I find, that's why I find so, this so inspiring is that it doesn't require superhuman uh, levels of repetition. Yeah, no, we're blowing up a whole culture. I mean, Molly even couldn't practice her by her own rules, right? Like yeah. afraid to take the week off before a performance. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. And I think, so this is where, I mean, I have a different, this method is different than Molly's. Molly's has a different yeah, spacing yeah, plan. But it's, but it's like, but you're, you're trying to deconstruct something that's like centuries old. Like this is how you learn. Well, <laughs> and this is, practice. this is the reason this is so difficult for people is that Matthew Walker even talks about this in, in the study I'm talking about. There's a difference between motor learning that happens within a session versus motor learning that's actually retained in long-term memory. And so what I'm talking about is just worrying about what's retained in long-term memory. Don't worry about what, what you can and cannot do, you know, this moment. In general, it, from day to day, it should be getting better. But that's how you assess your progress. Did I get better over these past few days and this past week? Don't worry about like, is this repetition I did right now better than the one I did before? Because those are different motor learning mechanisms. The, the, the massing mechanism where you're like, you're playing something 40 times in a row and you're really hot and in the zone, that's all going to dissolve on you. So why chase that when it's just, I mean, if you're in the studio and you got to get a correct take out of your instrument and you know that playing it 50 times in a row is going to boost you up so you can just lay this, this lick down, then do it. Then, then obviously do it. But I'm right. talking about long-term learning management that, that it just ends up being a giant waste of time. Yeah, so the, it, it's purpose-driven, of course, as everything is, as a context of what you're doing in the moment. And what you're doing in the moment is meditative. You feel the joy of playing, and you want to play that piece again, and you play it again and play it again, and, you, and you're enjoying it, and it's like fun for you to do that. Just realize you're not getting learning done. You're enjoying the moment. Sure, sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. As yeah. compared to what you're suggesting or somewhere in between. It, it's, um, a, it's a really liberating view on practice. <laughs> I, was, um, I was working, I have a few students that are in like the, the third and fourth grade of the Royal Conservatory right now. So I've been playing, uh, of piano, and I've been, and piano's not my main instrument. So I've been working on some of that stuff on the piano as well. The other weekend, I played every single piece in the, in the grade two RCM piano book and three book, like a few days in a row, not, not, not the whole piece, but in little chunks like this. And man, after like four, four days of doing that, like you get pretty good at doing them. And it's, it's just amazing. It's like, I don't actually have to repeat these pieces like 40 times a day to get good at them. I just got to touch on them and just make sure that the work so, I do is really honest and really clear, like audiation wise. So what's, so you're saying three times, each little section, each three little times. section, three times max. Yeah, there's one. Once you can do something a couple times in a row, just drop it and come back to it the next day. Don't just beat a dead horse. You're not. You're not going to get much out of it compared to just doing something else. Because like every time you play something five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times, you just spent seven repetitions on pl- something you're doing that you could have spent doing something else. You know, um, in terms of a technical challenge, I'd rather the way I'm looking at it now, I'd rather do something a few times every day for like a month or a few weeks, maybe with a day or two off, you know, here and there, um, and cover a bunch of different technical challenges rather than try to take one technical challenge and just 
you know, bludgeon myself with it. Cause it's, it's not actually as helpful as you think. Um, which is, it, it, it's, it's hard to even say that based off of yeah. like, you know, how I've practiced growing up. Well, it, it, like I said earlier, it's just all in the culture so much. It's just in the culture of like, this is what you do. You walk down the conservatory hall and I hear these people, you know, blow through stuff and it's just, and they stop and they fix something and then they keep going and then they blow through. <laughs> and you no know, nobody's taught them as far as I can, as far as I can tell. When to <laughs> and, move on. And, you know, what to do. Uh, you know, some of these guys may be so good that they're just getting it into their ear and can audiate the whole piece in one go. And it doesn't matter how sloppily they play it, they're going to get it the next time around maybe or something. Sure, sure. That they might be that, you know, genius at, at all this. But um, assuming that you're not in that crazy, you know, Paul, uh, what, no, what's his name? Lucas Foss. <laughs> I don't know who Paul okay. is. Paul Lucas? Lucas. Uh, anyway, do you know Lucas Foss? I don't think I do. I'm a, I'm, uh... He's the oboe player. And somebody okay. gave him uh, a piece, you know, before a rehearsal. And he, and he scanned through, you know, the 20 pages or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he put it down on the piano and then went into rehearsal. <laughs> like... Like encoded, like instantly memorized. You you wouldn't believe how good your notational <laughs> audiation and your just ability to learn new pieces works when you when you work like this because you're just constantly throwing new music at your brain. Your brain is constantly having to deal with new, new, new. Rather than your brain just shuts off by the time you're playing something forty times in a row. Like you're not you're not learning new skills at yeah. that point. So yeah. I was watching a a Bill Evans documentary the other day, and he you know, had all these Russian composer sheet music in, in his house when he was little. Mm -hmm. And he'd just get it out and play through it. And, he, and it took him a while, but by the time he was eight or nine, he was a pretty good sight reader. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I and, can see how this would... take the skills with Bill Evans. I mean, he... Mm -hmm. it's extraordinary. Uh, yeah. That... It's a... It's fascinating. Uh, speaking of documentaries, Wayne Shorter, Zero Gravity, mm -hmm. uh, another great documentary on on this man's uh, and 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 very entertaining. Bill Evans mm -hmm. is more of the regular kind of documentary, uh, still very good, and to get a sense of his life like that. But you consider how these people are involved in their music. Uh, you know, how do we get there? Mm -hmm. You know, how do, how do we get there? And can we get there by learning more repertoire? That would be a really good thing to do. I, right? I, I'm, I've am i been convinced of this for a long time, like since I found Paul Harris's work, this idea of, of more easy repertoire. But now I'm not even talking about easy. I'm just I'm just talking about covering more repertoire. Because if, if music is about learning patterns, harmonic patterns, melodic patterns, rhythmic patterns, why would learning more repertoire not actually be the answer and we know with with linguistic vocabulary like you're the bigger vocabulary that you hear yep. when you're a kid the better you're going to end off yeah. but but i never so, thought of pushing it to this kind of extreme you know so, before so yeah so now let's interleave <laughs> improvisation into this how would you synthesize that way of practicing and growing as an improviser what would you do I think, I mean, this is, this is why I love this podcast, Eric, because this is always, you know, <laughs> what both of us are up to, you know, we take one of these ideas and now start thinking like, uh, because this is exactly what I've been thinking about. How do you apply this to improv? I mean, I think a, a really good rule of thumb is improvise over more progressions, less time, because typically the mindset is, no, I really got to hammer something and master it today. And I got to, I got to beat this thing up for like, a two hour session straight. But now I'm thinking, you know what, you're probably better off. Take, take a bunch of progressions you want to master and do a little bit of work on them each day. And you might, you might, you so, might not get a, as high each day off of them, but over the long term, it's going to build into something. So over, so 
over the changes to Mary Had a Little Lamb, mm -hmm. right? you play four different melodies and then move on to a different chord progression. Like, or, or, you know, like another way <laughs> about it, you could do like, let's say we talk a lot about like reharmonizing some of these folk, these nursery rhyme folk I songs. I was going to get to that, but yeah not, yeah, not adding, I'm just saying one, one, five, one improvise four melodies that are different and then and, move on to a different chord progression or, or 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 so you do you do a few improvs over one one five one then you do a few improvs over one one tritone sub of five to one then you do a few over you know yeah, one it, two five but, but, one. but expanding it and then compare you know and then going back and forth among those over you know subsequent days yeah, Maybe. exactly. And, and and one of the things that I didn't talk about before with this, the, the challenge of working within this three repetition kind of ceiling is that you don't get time to like charge up. It's like you say, hey, brain, play this. You have one or two shots. You have to work on something that's actually manageable right now. You can't just like hit it 20 times, you screw up the first eight, the next four are fine and then the last eight are good you actually have to take a unit that's that's masterable within a couple repetitions like i can do this now and what this does is it it forces you to work within the realm of what you can actually handle rather than rather than just like things that are totally without you know, totally outside of your reach and so with improv i mean i think what happens a lot of times is like before people even sh before, like, people are trying to play over 16 bar progressions with tritone subs before they can even play the bass line. It's like, if yeah. you can't, if you can't add, if well, you can't add like one note to the bass line improv, right. like, you have no play, business taking on the, these huge. <laughs> play the root melody and, exactly. then, and then improvise a bass line. Or, right? like, step one, can or, you play the root melody and improvise a rhythm on it? Don't even change the like extra tones, like, just, yeah. just adding extra rhythms like and i think that's that's the thing that is screwing people up with improv yeah. is like i mean evans talked about this in his jazz you know or, or what, what was it the self-teaching like jazz and the art of self-discovery or teaching or whatever he yeah, is yeah. but he talked about people biting off more they more than they can chew instead of working on something that you can honestly handle people just try to approximate genius and and they just make spaghetti out of everything you know yeah but improvising mm -hmm. is like what are you improvising from so obviously baseline tonal patterns rhythm patterns the harmony are all in your wheelhouse mm -hmm. but now improvising you're you're you've got to let go of what it is you know or find right or find a spot in between what you can count on yourself to produce right now and you know and something else that you don't know you're going to play until it happens to you so anyway what i'm sure. what i'm leading this into is well why not play a few really fun licks over these progressions that you've uh either copped off of you know charlie parker <laughs> or whoever right and then mm. And then also have your own or your spin-offs on anything. This is what you've talked about so much is play a, a, you know, play a lick. And then once you've got that lick down, you know, don't use all the notes or add notes or, you know, change, cha change them so that you're alluding to the same lick and right. But, but you're learning a lick over these tunes wouldn't be a bad step toward getting yourself free to improvise over them N not over at the all changes and I, and I, that are that are completely creative say and i don't know what complete creativity is at that level anyway I, I i think this method of learning solos and and then basically improvising on other people's solos is is totally um unnecessarily criticized and if you look at i mean you look at Charlie Christian and Wes Montgomery and, you know, people that have really changed the history of, I'm, I'm talking about jazz guitarists right now, but if you look at any like really good soloist, they learned the solos of their mentors and a lot of them played them note for note. I mean, Wes Montgomery was known for playing Charlie Christian solos note for note on stage. And I mean, no one's going to tell me that he didn't end up doing fine because 
the um we talked about this so much on the podcast, but this idea, this this idea that Gordon brought to the table of learning the atomic units of of music, essentially tonal patterns when we're talking about uh, tonality, that's great. There, I, I think you should learn that. But we assume that by learning the atomic units, we're also going to magically be able to string them into bigger phrases. And I think that that cognitively makes no sense um, as as the primary and only strategy. You should learn the other way around where you take someone's whole melody or whole phrase that fits over a 16 bar progression and learn how to drop notes out of it or add notes to it. It's a different cognitive uh, process, like completely different. And so uh, learn solos, basically, is what I'm saying. Learn the solos that you like and learn how to take notes away from them and add notes to them and, you know, learn tonal patterns. Yeah, I'm curious whether... um... Dr. Gordon could, I'd, I'd like to hear him play. That's what I want. That's what I most want. I want to hear him play. Mm-hmm. I want to hear him play with Gene Krupa. I don't know the recordings where he's on, on, you know, I don't know how to, I, I, but I would like to hear him play. And then maybe I could understand more why he went down the road. He did, because you certainly can see uh, the difference uh, I, I'm just trying to read into the the man that was Ed Gordon, beyond the professor and beyond the music mm-hmm. theorist. I don't I don't know. It'd be curious to me. I'm dreaming here. It's it's I'm on vacation. But so I mean, does I mean, anybody back... have any recordings? That's what I want to know. I should look up in the University of South Carolina library. I mean, I remember hearing him like call out the changes to a Gershwin tune and his like his fluency of doing that reminds me of, you know, any other great jazz musician I've met that can do that when they're, they're kind of, they're describing their audiation of a tune while they're doing it. And so I don't, I don't doubt that he could do this stuff. And, you know, I don't even, Oh no, I'm not it's even not cu- that I'm, I'm curious about his improvisation and sure. I'm just really, you know, like to know the musician better. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, so, I mean, in, in relation to like fusing this kind of practice strategy, that's very cognizant of the effects of sleep. Um, I mean, cover more skills over, you know, do, do more skills, but less repetitions of those skills. And, and I mean, this is like, this is like direct instruction 101. I mean, this is how Engelman laid out his own, um, curriculum cover lots of skills now in micro sized form and grow them you know it's basically like grow the whole garden now from seed don't don't start with one plant that you bring to fruition <laughs> and then okay now i have technique down or now i have major down so now i'm going to add you know something else uh, and i was talking to someone about this with harmony over email today i mean i think a lot of people they don't expose students to like air quote more advanced harmony simply because some of these chords have like intimidating sounding names, which is right tone substitution. I know it's stupid, but my kids know it, but they don't, they, we just don't call it that, <laughs> they, but they hear it. Yeah. Yeah. They or, recognize I mean, it. They're not identifying yet. They can, they sing the roots when I play them. Yeah. Yeah. That's or even, I, I think four. such a good, such a good <laughs> harmonic, a harmonic goal that I think every teacher should get to is being able to hear every secondary dominant in major and minor with the tritone sub off of it. If you can do that, so many uh, things that will come at you in any kind of music, classical jazz, There's it just takes the mystery. I mean, even Bach makes more sense once you start looking at it like that. But just knowing those basic progressions. But the question is how many people are exposing their ears to each of those sounds a couple times a day? I mean, I think that explains why people can't improvise better than anything else I've heard, you know, because who cares what your aptitude is if you're not even exposed to these sounds? I mean, does, you might as well have zero aptitude. Well, yeah, yeah, you need the <laughs> you need the oral of improvisation, which is listening to people that are master improvisers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean especially with these progressions, though, it's like if if you go listen to like Bill Evans, there's so much stuff coming at you or like Barry Harris, like often you don't get to hear, you don't get to hear someone just play some, like the two, five of three in its most basic fundamental form without the bells and whistles of, you know, all this crazy yeah. stuff happening next to it. This is where I want a jazz, you know, genius 
the guy that just knows every little thing, like a Mary Lou Henner who has that, <laughs> you know, about these people. I have a, a high school classmate who you could say January 23rd, 1972. And he'll mm -hmm. tell you the weather. He'll tell you where he was. <laughs> it's insane. And Mary Lou Henner has this thing. It's like it's ridiculous photo graphic memory okay and i want somebody like that who's a jazz musician who can like <laughs> knows all the repertoire like oh sonny rollins on this tune hmm. uh you know <laughs> like he's just he's by himself there's no bass playing and he's just covering the changes i mean that'd be nice so you know and someone, then, so and then like okay in. now put that in order i anyway i'm not gonna live long enough for all the dreams i have but you know the one th the one thing I did want to say though about the the challenge in doing this kind of practice with our students is that you so I've heard other people talk about this but not really with the lens of audiation added into this like I've heard people talk about like adding parts of the song in reverse reverse chaining you know ch building the chunks up from from four note units to eight note units and stuff like that but the problem is like let's say you're working in a, in a bar of music with 16th notes and you're going to start from the last group of 16th notes in a bar. Now I know how to audiate well enough that, and I can tell when I'm audiating and when I'm not audiating that when I play that the last six, the last four notes in that bar, I can tell if I'm hearing that in the right context. Am I hearing it in the right key? Am I hearing it in the right, all of that. But when I send a student home with this strategy, they may not be auditing the right thing at that point in time. Because like if they started from bar one, from beat one, and there's a tonic chord and they establish context, and by the time they get to beat four, they're hearing beat four in context. But some people might not be at the ability where on their own, they can start from beat four and let's say beat four is, has an A minor chord, but you're actually in the key of you know G major. Are they, do they know they're not hearing that in context? when they're doing that. And so there's other problems that come with using these techniques where when I'm with a student, I can make sure they're hearing this in context, even when we're practicing it in a screwed up way. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's one thing I've never really heard added to this viewpoint, but it's, that's just totally a logical extension of applying MLT, you know, to some of these practice concepts. But I do think that's a big problem because like if you send, if you send students home to practice in this way, but they have no way of, forcing themselves into the right context. It, get, it can get weird really fast. Yeah, I can't imagine that anybody who's been a good improviser didn't, like, cover all the MLT bases on their own. Mm -hmm. That's, hence the title of the podcast, right? So they've, ha they've had to, whether they've... Uh, whether they've messed up the sequence along the way or not, Bottom line is they got the oral, oral and 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 improvised. That's all. You, well, I mean, this is what blew my mind about MLT. If you have like, enough what, aptitude, right? The, yeah. The well, when I when I found MLT, I, and time to practice, and they want to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't know. I think I was like twenty eight or something when I found MLT. But like when I read learning sequences in music, I mean, I, I read it a lot. And I, I think I've read the book like 50 times, but everything he was saying made so much sense because it was all things I had discovered on my own, which makes total sense because by the time I, by the time I read learning sequences of music, I could already audiate like all the stuff yeah. he was talking about tonally. And I had been through, I, I knew what context was. I knew did these different tonalities. I knew the same function sounded different in different tonalities. And because like, you have to arrive at those insights if you're going to teach yourself to audiate. But yeah. then I had someone that, actually explain it. That's what very... makes this theory so brilliant is that it's just everywhere. It's, it's you know, the dark energy of music education. Yeah. It's to, we don't know what it is, but it's in. Yeah, exactly. But uh... <laughs> All right. Well, I should go to sleep. So, or I mean, should we hopefully... digest, this, digest this episode uh, 30 seconds at a time? Well, I mean, my... my... <laughs> The recommendation to people is to try this technique. Take take a new piece of music that's a, a decent level for you. And um, I mean, you can even run your own study. Take two pieces of music. Like, you know, if, you, if you're a guitarist, take a couple of Bach pieces that are at the same level and learn one with your own practice strategy, however you want to do. 
you like doing 30 repetitions of everything a day, do it. And then take another piece and do what I'm recommending now where you break things into small units, only practice them a couple times a day and see what happens over the course of two or three weeks. I bet you you'll be extremely surprised, you know? Yeah. No, it's take a chance, do something different, try it. Who knows better how you learn than you do? I mean, a coach is very important. We've talked about this before. You want somebody who sees you for yourself bigger than you do for yourself, Mm -hmm. right? And they can push you into certain and hear certain things that you don't hear yourself. But when it comes to like what works for you, like teach yourself to bust a boundary and learn from that. And, you know, maybe it certain things don't work as well, but, but give this a shot because I'm more and more convinced. I saw a recent study on, you know, 30 minutes is the, is the sweet zone for a nap. It's a rest. They call it a rest. You don't really Mm -hmm. go to sleep or if you do fine. Right. But it's 30 to 40 minutes. Nothing more than that. I like my hour and a half nap sometimes, man. So, but I don't necessarily feel better. Yeah, fair enough. You know, getting up. Uh, but, yeah. I mean, that, I, the, the naps are interesting. There's like Anders Ericsson who did that seminal research on the, the 10,000 hour rule that Malcolm Gladwell popularized in Outliers came from Anders Ericsson's research on mm-hmm. violinists at this elite um, German you know music conser- conservatory. And they found that when you split the, the violinists into to groups of how likely it is that they're going to become world-class performers. I mean, it's basically the amount of hours of actual deliberate practice they were doing that influenced what group they were in. But what was really interesting is the, 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 um, at the very upper levels, a lot of it just came down to how much they were sleeping a day. The people who were at the very, very top levels were all practicing the same amount of intensity and they had the same quality teachers, same uh, resources in general and all that. It was just like some of them were napping for like two hours a day, which if you think about these sleep consolidation benefits, if you get a two hour nap in every single day, I mean, assuming music is your life, you're getting, you're essentially on steroids musically compared to the people that aren't doing it. (laughs) There are only a handful of Saturdays. In three years, I mean three years, in 23 years, only a handful of Saturdays, mm-hmm. over 23 years, that when I got home, mm-hmm. I ate and I went to bed. That was it. <laughs> Wait, there's a handful, hold on, there's a, there's only a handful that you did that or didn't do that? That didn't do that. <laughs> oh, okay, there you go, yeah. I, did, I, did I say it wrong? Uh, yeah, no, I, no, I don't even eat. I don't even eat because I ate lunch. Yeah, no, I ate lunch. I taught till two. I got home by a quarter three. By 3.30, I was asleep. And there's only a handful, maybe 10, over all these years where I I had something important enough that I didn't go to sleep. Well, for the last few years, I've been doing landscaping for a few hours in the morning. I go home and take a nap for an hour, and then I teach all evening. (laughs) And I like, I was keeping the landscaping in my life as a job, literally so I could have a lifestyle that allowed me to nap. I'm not in a lifestyle right now that allows me to do that. And it's, I'm not, I'm saying my practice has been teaching. (laughs) I I sleep after my teaching. So it just mushes everything I've been doing. Uh, and I've, maybe I've gotten the benefit from the sleep that I've always had right after I've taught. This opens up another huge conversation about, you know, in, in terms of talent, we, we think of like talent or aptitude, like it could, it could be music aptitude or even like I'm convinced there's motor learning aptitude because like some kids that oh, I see, sure. like they, their motor learning just seems so much faster, like not even audiation, like things that aren't even difficult to audiate. They're just difficult to play physically on the guitar, for example. But the the talent for that might not be coming down to, to an actual um, talent they have for motor learning. Their brains might just be sleeping more efficiently 
They're, so their brain might just be sleeping at a higher quality. And then you do that over a course of weeks or, or years. And it seems like there's a talent, but really the talent yeah. is that like the brain encodes information better when it's sleeping. There's a, um, there's, this is starting to get into like really weird territory, but it, I don't think there's anything commercially available <laughs> right now, but you can actually go to like a sleep researcher and it is currently possible for them to drive you into REM sleep um, artificially harder than you normally would. And that increases the efficiency of learning. And, and I've also often thought about like, how could I find like some kind of, you know, I do my Bach practice once a week, I go to the sleep researcher in the middle of the day or something. And they just like drive me into REM sleep harder than I normally would get into just to learn the pieces better. I mean, I think we're yeah. going to start seeing stuff like that uh, in the future. Well, I'm, I've <laughs> all of a sudden I'm interested in the correlational study between, you know, music aptitude scores and the sleep the kids are getting. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, but I got a three-year-old. Well, is she almost four? She four. Did she turn four? She just turned four, probably. Um, but she can do seven, eight, ba 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 She does that, like, a little, when she wants to. <laughs> well, and this is why we might see bigger gains in music aptitude based on tr training at a younger age, because these kids are freaking sleeping all the time, and they sleep way more hours yeah. per day. <laughs> well, IQ's been going up, what? three points a decade or so yeah I, I mean you know what's going on there so why wouldn't music aptitude do the same thing i don't know anyway yeah, the, the, the flynn money. effect of music aptitude <laughs> send us your I, money. Hold, hold on hold on let's back up for a sec does <laughs> so we know from the flynn effect that i like the flynn effect is the observation that iq has been going up over the last whatever it is 100 or 200 years but um so wait are you saying music aptitude has been going up or has not i i i would assume that it would but we have to do a massive study to do that and nobody's okay. done that i mean terry bacon we should have terry bacon on and mm -hmm. have him talk about what he discovered about uh about uh primary measures of music audiation intermediate measure pmma and imma uh because wait can yeah, you give us we, the we cliff notes here we got to get into the weeds about what he what he thinks about about those measures. Wait, what's the audiation. Cliff Notes versions of what he thinks? Do you I, know? I, d I dare not even. As in, something might not line up. <laughs> I there, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> sure, there's a lot of questions, and I'd like to hear those questions raised by him. Um, I don't. I didn't read his study yet. Oh, I've okay. heard him present it twice. Oh, okay. Well, fair enough. You know, it's it's worth going to and, and going to see it again. But mm -hmm. so it, it's got a there's some fruit there somewhere. I do just want to mention again, though, that um, everyone should check out Molly Gavrian's YouTube channel because she's got I believe she has a whole series on the sleep and how it relates to practicing music because Matthew Walker's book why we sleep is a fantastic read but it's not a, it's not a musically specific book I I think he he talks about a piano player at some point being like of course sleep <laughs> is what matters but you know those are things that professional amazing professional musicians just start noticing after teaching and stuff but Molly herself who's an amazing musician and you know I she has a background in neuroscience. She's she's got a lot to say about this, and uh, highly recommend you guys check it out if you're interested. But I, I mean, what I like about this is it makes you think about practice at a longer scale than just the individual practice session. You know, so it's plan. You start planning your sessions like on a week long basis. Like, okay, I need to do this once every week or two to not lose it. So that's when I'm going to do it. But this new piece, I'm going to try to hit every day or, or three days in a row. And then I take a couple, you know, whatever it is, you start, start making a strategy, um, almost like a weightlifter would like a weightlifter is not just, unless they're a power lifter, they're not just like doing squats every day. You know, they have a, they have a program that they're following and we need to, uh, I'm not saying I have like the, the answer with a capital a, but through experimentation, you start realizing I don't need to do this a hundred times a day to actually, um, benefit from it. And so, yeah, we're not at the point where we have definitive answers about this, but we, uh, we have directions to head in that make more sense. 
And, and I like this from the student's perspective too, because like a lot of kids that are kind of into music, but they're not fully on board with like adopting like a hardcore practice schedule or whatever, you can tell them, look, like take two of these songs this week that we started and just play them a couple of times each and make sure you're actually mastering little sections. And you know, that's, that's generally good enough for someone who's experimenting with an instrument, but not at the point where they're, they're trying to be super, you know, serious and hardcore about it. And you can see it with, with young kids. I mean, I was telling Eric off air earlier that this one guitarist that I teach um, she's always progressing week for week. And I'm, I'm always interested to hear like, how are you practicing and what are you doing? And her strategy is simple. I just work on it every day <laughs> for 20 <laughs> minutes. And it really does work. If, if, if they're practicing correctly in the way that they're like actually working on things that are achievable and they're doing it a couple times a day and they're practicing generally every day. I mean, people just get better. It's, it's, it's surprisingly, um, it doesn't sound mysterious when you hear a kid describe it like that. But when you start thinking about all this research that's underneath, okay, she's taking advantage of the spacing effect. She's taking advantage of the sleep consolidation. She's doing all of this like audiation stuff while she's doing mm-hmm. this. I mean, it's just these simple strategies that people have. It's like, well, I just practice for 20 minutes a day. They actually make sense. You know, yeah. the <laughs> cover photo for one of her videos is why we sleep. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, hopefully her, I don't know when her book's coming out. Yeah. Yeah. So I encourage everyone to to nap. (laughs) Maybe this, maybe this podcast will put them to sleep. This is this, why we sleep has such, had such a big impact on my love hate relationship with caffeine. (laughs) Cause I, so I quit drinking caffeine for months. Uh, I think it was like six months, four or six months to see if it would improve the quality of my naps which it definitely did. But now I'm back on the sauce and I need to, <laughs> I need to cut the caffeine. Uh, cause I'm, I'm convinced that the extra sleep that I get during the nap performance wise is better than the caffeine high basically. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It hijacks the brain a little, I bet. Yeah. I mean, that's something Matt Walker talks about in his book that if you look at the, the EEG scans or whatever of, of people who are drinking caffeine. It's not pretty <laughs> when they're sleeping. Um, so, you know, yeah. that's nothing short of terrifying for me. Oh boy. I wonder how many, how many great musicians do you know, Eric, that don't drink caffeine? I mean, you probably know a lot of jazz musicians, which I imagine most of them are drinking. I don't know that many. I, I have no idea. Cause I thought it was interesting that Molly, well, she's, mentioned to me that she doesn't drink caffeine. And I always thought like, Hmm, I wonder if that's having like a real positive impact on her motor learning. Mm -hmm. Possibly. Yeah. I don't know. There's a lot, a lot of studies to be done if we're going to be scientific about these ideas. Yeah. So like I said earlier, throw us your money. (laughs) <laughs> some millionaire out there will catch wind of this okay so if you had money if you if you if you had the money to run to run one any study but one study what would you run me yeah like if you if someone was like hey whatever music study you want to run i'll fund it but you can only really investigate one thing one thing yeah uh i would just drill deeper into my harmonic audiation mm-hmm. and you know, like really find out how early kids are doing it, you know, get brain and, and prenatal, prenatal experience. Mm-hmm. Like where does music aptitude begin? And yeah, I mean, I could, I could go on for lifetime mm-hmm. um, and eventually we're going to find out more questions but you know what's the intersection between aptitude and uh, you know string theory <laughs> <laughs> yep. that's got to be out there somewhere that's a vibration that occurs 
Yeah, I imagine like at one point we're gonna we're gonna realize something really like like omega three supplementation between the ages of zero and three could increase aptitude like in general if the training is held stable by like you know twenty yeah, well, percent or something. Problem like is keeping the <laughs> you know keeping the the controlled group. Cause that's thing that that's something like I'm sure there's some kind of supplement or some kind of nutritional impact because there's no doubt that a deficit in certain nutrients could have a uh, a negative impact on aptitude development. Well, it, but but I found you know with the kids that not having good nutrition at all, uh, mm-hmm. I have their aptitude is it's fine. not not it's not bad at all not compared to it, yeah. it's no different and mm. in, in, in food deserts yeah fair enough I mean that could be the case I think it, it matters is that maybe there's an effect but the people in those communities that are struggling with nutrition say uh, just have that much more music experience early in life yeah i mean that could be possible so it's just canceling so it out yeah they, so but yeah there's a, there's a thousand research studies i really like to i'd really like to investigate the difference between someone learning to um l- let's say you know in terms of improv like what's the best way to actually teach improv and I'd like to have a group that does only tonal patterns and then another group that does um, learning whole solos and then another group that learns whole solos and tonal patterns because I'm convinced that the order of quality would be the both group and then the whole solo group and then the tonal pattern group, which I think is very un... I don't think a lot of uh, uh, MLT teachers would think yeah. it would be in that order. It'd be, I'd be curious and do that with... All the all the instruments we have, the uh, mm-hmm. instruments being measures of the harmonic improvisation readiness record and and the map mm-hmm. test and all of the map subtests. <laughs> that would be great. Oh, it'd be so much fun. I've got yeah, ten was... years. I I'd probably got <laughs> ten years. Yeah, fair enough. How do we find these people? All yeah, right. see, if I wasn't trying to jam in like a few hours of practice every day, I'd actually take being a researcher seriously. <laughs> All right. Well, can I can I go eat now? <laughs> yeah, we're gonna we're gonna let Eric eat. If anyone, uh, you know, just as a final comment, if anyone has any uh, questions about anything they heard, uh, my email is always open. I love people, love to talk to people about this.